All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Um, I'm seeing lots of interesting notes in the chat about kinds of things that people have eaten, lots and lots of plants. And then somebody had some tasty lionfish in the Caribbean. Um, might have to hear about that. Um, so yeah, thanks for answering the, uh, the poll. If you're calling in, I saw there were a few folks. Um, I'll leave the polling open so as folks come in, they can still fill it out. Um, but it looked like we did have some, some folks from outside of uh, California and even outside the country, which is super exciting. We had a lot of interest in today's webinar and um, I'm excited about it as well. I think it's a great topic. So um, this uh, is put on by two organizations, um, the University of California's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources and the nonprofit California Invasive Plant Council. So I'd like to give you a quick background on each uh, for background on UCANR. Um, Sabrina or Elliot, you wanna hop on and tell us briefly uh, what the university is up to. Sure. Um, so I'm Sabrina Drill. I'm the Natural Resources Advisor for Los Angeles and Ventura Counties um, for University of California Cooperative Extension, which is Cooperative Extension is the largest program under the University of California Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, as I mentioned, I'm natural resources and a lot of the work on invasive species happens there, but we also have programs in everything from sort of standard commercial and small farms agriculture, horticulture, um, 4-H youth development program, we run the Master Gardener program, and the California Naturalist program and climate stewards. Um, we do a lot of our invasive species work also happens through our integrated pest management program, which includes a variety of pests, not just invasive species, but um, yeah, that's it. Come find us at ucanr.org if you're looking for more information on this stuff. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, well, we're really happy to be partnering with uh, UCANR for, I can't remember if it's the fourth or fifth year of these webinars. Um, Calypsi is a nonprofit organization. We're in our 30th year and we are membership driven and um, have mostly land managers, but also researchers and volunteer stewards across the state who are part of the organization. Um, we have an annual conference. Our 30th annual symposium is coming up this October. It'll be online, which makes it uh, simpler and cheaper to attend. Um, our website has a ton of resources on invasive plants. It's really your one-stop shop um, hub for finding out about any particular invasive plant or particular strategies for managing invasive plants. Um, we work closely with partner groups like CNPS, the Native Plant Society, like the National Park Service, and a whole bunch more throughout the state. We maintain the uh, default list of invasive plants in California, the Calypsi inventory, also on our website. Um, so please do check it out. Lots of resources and tools there for you to use. All right. Um, Quickly, as noted here on this, uh, this entry slide, we are gonna use the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, you should see a button that says Q&A. That's where you can ask a question of the presenters. Um, we have people behind the scenes that are reading through those and we'll read them out at the end of the presentation. They will also be potentially answering some of them um, by typing text. So check back there. And then if you have any technical challenges that we might be able to help with, use the chat for that. And of course, use the chat for chatting. Okay. Um, quick background on the California Invasive Species Action Week. Um, this is a takeoff on the National Invasive Species Awareness Week, which has been going for decades. Um, the California Invasive Species Action Week Oh dear, so I guess that's not just me. 
for whom Doug has frozen. Yuda, do you want to take over from Doug? Uh, yeah, uh, to the degree that I know where we <laughs> ended, since the same happened to me. Um, Doug, are you back on, though? I just heard your voice. Ah, no. Um, I, well, I think I, I think we were just mentioning that this is part of California yeah. Invasive Species Action Week, which yeah. in addition to these um, webinars through the week, um, there's a lot of activities um, you can volunteer for more out in the field, as well as other educational activities that are online or in person um, at the uh, Invasive Species Week website, which you can reach from our website. Um, and we can maybe pop the direct it's link in the in chat. There as well. And yeah. then just note that we have um, uh, four, uh, three other, sorry, I'm tired. We have three other um, webinars coming up this week. So tomorrow we'll be talking about like Tahoe. Thursday we'll be talking about um, urban forest pests. And Friday we'll be talking about Spartina in the Bay. Right. And I guess thanks. With that, I'll hand Sabrina. it over to you, Yuda, to introduce our speakers. Sure thing. Yeah. And I think Doug has managed to come back on, but um, we'll move over to introducing our speakers here. Really happy hi. to uh, hi, hey, Yuta. Doug. Yeah. Hey, hey, howdy. Yes, I did make it back. Let me um, just quickly end the polling and throw that oh, at you. That sounds good. Yes. Uh huh. Um, um, because it's been neck and neck between NorCal and SoCal, and it ended up in a perfect tie, 47 to 47, um, and then folks from other states. Um, let's see, we've got uh, a lot of folks who are somewhat um, familiar with invasive uh, species, and some folks who know a lot, and some folks who don't know a lot, so that's great. And uh, a lot of folks that have eaten invasive species. So you're you're adventurous. All right, take it away, Utah. That's good. All right. So not only are we uh, partnering together, UCA and R, to to put on this uh, seminar series this week, we also have a, a nice team, two organizations that are are going to be speaking to us today about fire invasive plants and what you can do. Happy to have both Joey Algiers and Andrea Williams uh, to speak with us. Joey is the National Parks Restoration Ecologist at the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, where he leads the Invasive Plant Management Program and the Restoration Program. He has a lot of experience, probably more than he wants, uh, with a fire and its effects in Southern California. And he's currently leading a super ambitious invasive plant management program. Uh, not that they aren't always super ambitious that engages volunteers and incorporates early detection to stop the spread of invasive species. Before I hand it over to you, Joe, I'm just gonna introduce Andrea quickly and then you'll hand off to her. Andrea Williams is the Director of Biodiversity Initiatives at the California Native Plant Society. Um, she's been specializing in science-based public lands management, mapping, removing invasive plants, and tracking plants and habitats. She's also helped to develop regional land health metrics, prioritize invasive plants in the Bay Area, and she's currently spearheading a campaign to get volunteers involved in post-fire native and invasive plant monitoring efforts that she's going to tell you about. So, Joey, take it away. Thank you, Yuna. Sure. I think we're not hearing you. Are you unmuted? I think I'm, I'm up now. Does you see my slide? I'm just sharing the screen. Yes. Perfect. And we're moving, right? All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Joey Algiers. I'm the restoration ecologist for uh, the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area for the National Park Service. Um, and today I'll be talking about the invasive plant control work we've been doing after the Woolsey fire. Uh, it was a fire that occurred in 2018. And um, I'll be talking about the, the work we've been doing 
and then also some of the um, including some of the early detection and rapid response uh, approaches that we take to finding some of the most aggressive invasive species in our mountains. Um, so this is uh, a map of the Santa Monica Mountains uh, National Recreation Area. That's the National Park Service unit. It's in the Los Angeles area. If you look here on um, the southeast part of the map, that's Los Angeles. And this area here in blue, this polygon, is the protected national recreation area. So it's a place for Angelinos to, to recreate. People come from around the world to visit the Santa Monica Mountains. It has some of the best examples of the types of resources that you find only in the California Floristic Province. Um, and then this red polygon here is the footprint of the Woolsey Fire. So you can see it burned close to half of the, the national recreation area. Uh, no other fire in recorded history has burned this much of the Santa Monica Mountains. It's the largest fire that we've ever experienced. And it burned uh, close to 90% of National Park Service land, which is uh, the dark green um, that you see here, like Zuma Canyon, Circle X Ranch, Chesborough Canyon. Uh, really only one major site, Rancho Sierra Vista, that did not burn in the Woolsey Fire. So it... Um, it you know, made it so that our hands were, were quite full uh, immediately after the fire. And this is just a table showing you some of the protected lands in the Santa Monica Mountains. And so again, close to 90% of National Park Service land that burned from the Woolsey Fire, but state park land burned as well. Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, they own a lot of land. They had a good amount of their land burned also. And uh, we all work together, you know, seamlessly across the different uh, land ownerships uh, that try to create a seamless experience for visitors and um, try to carry out a, a landscape level um, treatment and control of our invasive species that occur in our mountains. Okay, so here is uh, what the mountains look like. It was a pretty complete burn, and this is the advantage that invasive species have after a fire. It creates all this open substrate. So you have vegetative matter that is burned to the ground. It uh, charges the soil with these uh, with nutrients. It opens up sunlight, uh, our slower to germinate and slower growing native species uh, have a hard time when invasive species capitalize on these areas because they basically uh, disallow our native species from recovering after a fire. So it's a real opportunity for invasive species to get a foothold in these areas. Um, in spots where maybe they hadn't been before as well. So a big part of the work that we do is we go after where we know the weed infestations are, but we're also surveying and looking for new infestations, maybe weeds, of course, that don't occur in our mountains at all, but also um, invasive plant species that, that um, don't occur at certain sites. So there are sites that we have and although there are um, invasive species that are quite ubiquitous at other sites, they don't occur in certain sites and sometimes we see them pop up. So right away, we take that early detection rapid response approach um, is more of kind of like a localized um, management strategy. Um, the funding that we, that we received for treating the invasive species after the fire is called a burn and, and I'm sorry, a bear and bar. Uh, funding is federal funding. Uh, BEAR stands for Burn Area Emergency Rehabilitation. And um, that is for the, the first year after a fire. There's a recognition and understanding that it is an emergency situation. These invasive species can displace our natives, but many of them are also um, contributing to the, the problems that we have with fire. They are either more flammable, they dry out quicker, they extend the fire season. Um, and so it's understood as an emergency and right away we're out there hustling, trying to catch everything that we can. And we had a great crew that did a great job with that. Right now we're on our third year of funding. It is, it's called um, BAR funding and um, the crew is ahead of schedule and doing great. And so you've probably seen this before, uh, those of you who have experience um, in, in, with invasive species, but the basic idea is that if you wait on an invasive species, the longer you wait, um, the costs go up and it becomes more difficult to control invasive species. So these are species that 
are quite prolific. Uh, they they prop they they set seed tons of seed. They um, they spread very quickly. And so uh, if you can catch them nice and early, that's going to save you a lot of money in the long run. Um, so there's a lot of strategies for that. We have all of our technicians are um, biologists. They all have biology degrees. And when they see something that that uh, doesn't look quite right, it's just sort of um, it, it sets off bells in their head and they, they ask all the right questions and they bring stuff back and we, we check it out. And then they know the target species quite well that we're, um, that we're going after as well as uh, a lot of the flora that occurs in the Santa Monica Mountains. So it really helps to have those careful eyes that are out there um, surveying these areas and catching stuff nice and early. But we're also exploring reaching out for, um, to the community for community engagement and trying to use um, sites like iNaturalist, for example, to try to, to have the public help us in identifying where this stuff is. More eyes, the better. And this is all stuff that uh, um, Andrea will talk about as well. Okay, so this here is um, just a, a collage of the 25 uh, most ecologically damaging invasive species in our mountains, or at least that um, a list of local practitioners has put together. Um, we call it our evil, the evil 25. There are other invasive species that are outside of this list that are quite in invasive and cause all sorts of problems. For example, um, mustards and annual grasses, but Part of what makes this list is that the treatment of these species needs to be feasible. And on a regional scale, we, there's not really much we can do about mustards and annual grasses. They're so widespread across California. But these other species, we can do something about, and so we should. We shouldn't just allow them to also um, become as obnoxious as some of the more um, ubiquitous weeds that we have in our mountains. So this here is our mountain range and, and we're showing you now um, the colored uh, polygons. Those are all the protected areas, the, the green being the California Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, state parks, and then uh, blue MRCA. And then the grayish color is the National Park Service. And so our crew is focusing the vast majority of their efforts on um, the treatments of these 25 invasive species, this is what they're surveying for, this is what they're looking for um, inside of the burn area. And so these are numbers from um, 2020, from last year, they surveyed over 1600 um, acres, that's the area in yellow. Um, but they now by this point have surveyed well over 2000 acres because they keep expanding the areas that they're, they're looking for each year. Um, and they're able to do that because of reductions in um, invasive species, which is buying them time and allowing them to move on to new areas. So they're going to, you know, we have more than a decade of um, invasive species control work that we did before the fire. And um, our team is going to those locations because we know that's where the weeds were before. And then they're surveying a buffer beyond the, that point to see if there are any other invasive species or if in, in, or invasion, uh, the invasive species that we know of, these infestations have expanded. Um, so they've treated over 800 acres, uh, 800 gross acres of, of this area. And the work is done in every way you can think of. We, we do chemical, uh, mechanical, and uh, manual treatments as well. Uh, we just got that Ventrac mower that you see. We do cutting and painting. This is with SCA crew, backpack sprayers. Um, we work with uh, career employment opportunity um, folks as well. So this is them doing some brush cutting. And this was all part of bear and now burn area rehabilitation work. And here's our crew. This is their album cover. Um, they look marvelous and um, they're amazing. So they do a lot of the work themselves, but then they're also working with these groups. Um, and we have a weed warrior program where we work with volunteers 
uh, as well. And this is fantastic, but unfortunately we had to stop this um, because of COVID. Just recently, we're now starting to open up again to smaller groups. And we have a couple of uh, events this week for a California Invasive um, Species Action Week. Actually today, uh, we just finished a, an event and then yesterday as well. But this is, uh, these are volunteers that are hand pulling Carnation Spurge at Zuma Canyon. And um, sometimes we bring in high school groups. This is a high school group of uh, about 90. You can see the bus in the background there. We have 90 high school students pulling up tree tobacco and Carnation Spurge in the Malibu area. Um, we even provide uh, hard hats in some of the burn areas. The burn areas are a bit more difficult to work in um, when there's cover above, we have to be careful for hazard trees and whatnot. And so um, we, were, we were cautious about the work that we did with volunteers in those areas, but they come in handy because we had amazing wildflower blooms, uh, native wildflower blooms, some of the best that I've ever seen following the fire. We had some good rains in 2019. And so that detailed work is really nice. And when you get more hands, it makes the work a lot easier. All right, so here's some of the results. Um, what we wanted to know was, uh, one of the big things we wanted to know was, you know, have, did the work that we did before the fire, did that have um, a mitigating effect, you know, after the fire? So, uh, you know, one of the things we hear is, you know, that we're doing all this work, but then if you have a disturbance like a fire, everything just bounces back to where it was before. And so we looked at 270 infestations that were recorded before the fire. They were inventoried um, between 2005 and 2016, which means that this is the net acreage of those, all of those species lumped together, all of those infestations lumped together. Um, this is the net acreage at the time uh, of inventory, meaning that they had not been treated yet. So um, in other words, if you were to hand pull every individual and line them up side by side so that they're touching, so there's no space in between them, it would make up about 57 um, football fields. So in 2017, we went through and we revisited those 270 infestations. Now this is before the Woolsey fire. So it shows that the work that we're doing uh, is really working. It's dropping down to about four football fields, which is a, a dramatic improvement there's a lot of work that went into the first these, these 10 years. Um, and then you have the Woolsey fire occur in um, 2018. And so now what would we expect to see? Um, well, it does bounce up to about 12 football fields, but we're not seeing it bounce up to the 57 like it was before. So um, I was surprised to find that a lot of the areas that we had treated um, looked really good. and um, you know, I guess I hadn't seen a big fire like this before in across so many different areas that we treated. So I was a little concerned, but actually a lot of those areas looked good. Um, in 2020, we're about the same. Uh, the reason for that is there's a couple of species that got away from us um, and we were able to look at our top invasive species. You can see that um, we did a really good job with yellow star thistle. Uh, it did bounce up. This is uh, the blue, I'm sorry, is um, the time of inventory. So before, from, from 2005 to 2016, and then 2017 is the red. The fire happened and then in 2019, we see it jump up. This is the green bar here and we treat it and then we're dropping it back down again, 2020. This year, it looks great. Um, the technicians are telling me they're seeing between you know five and 10 individuals in some of the infestations that they treated last year or so. Um, if we had not treated this at all, I, I can guarantee you it would be, you know, up and beyond this, uh, and we would have a much harder problem. Um, we are seeing an increase in carnation spurge and in perennial pepperweed, and this is largely due to the fact that we've had to halt some of our chemical treatments due to public concerns. Um, so this is what happens when you take your foot off the gas with um, invasive species. They can pop back, and perennial pepperweed's almost back to where it was. But Italian thistle and harding grass is looking great. Um, and then this is it by site. And it, you know, Peter Strauss Ranch is an area where we've had all the way to the right here 
it's an area where we've had problems um, with public concerns using herbicide. And so it's really jumped up perennial pepperweed. They, we were able to get it this year, fortunately, but um, you know, that's really what's driving the, if you were to take that out of the equation, then we would see a greater drop in um, invasive species between 2019, 2020. So here's a, a better example of um, the weed work that we've done. This is back in 2009 before it had been treated. This is all yellow star thistle, which is this yellow flowered stuff. This is at Paramount Ranch. And you can see it go through this area here, this sort of drainage and up around here, that's all yellow star thistle. And then in 2015, after years of treatment, it's now all slender tarweed, native slender tarweed, and the yellow star thistle is gone. Um, and so this is just it now, years later. After the fire, I went in early, this is in 2019, and um, this is all California poppies that are coming up in that same area. And then later in the year, it's returning back to um, tarweed, to native tarweed. And that's what's there now. And so there's just no, no more um, yellow star thistle. So it's great, you know, we didn't see the yellow star thistle explode back to what it was. Instead, we started seeing native herbaceous plants come in, in into that, uh, in those places instead, which is wonderful. Okay, so what about the ubiquitous weeds? Well, yeah, I'll show you, like you can see that here, that that's surrounding um, ubiquitous weeds is like, you know, mustards and annual grasses, for example. And of course, then this is Mark Mendelson, our botanist, who's traveling through a forest of black mustard. We saw a lot of that um, in the burn areas and you know it's heartbreaking, but uh, on a regional scale on a large scale, there's not much we can do about it. We do try to control it when it occurs near restoration sites and when it occurs near sensitive habitat, but um, it is just so difficult. And so I think really the key to this is just more of a chipping away at it, uh, removing it, but then putting a native species um, in its place. And I mean, if we could do some larger scale timed mowings and, and whatnot, but I don't know what the seed bank looks like in, in this place. So timed mowing is something that we're gonna start looking at um, next year. We've got a project to start looking at that and you can cover large grounds that way. So hopefully we'll find some good strategies. Um, so now I wanna get into um, a little bit, just finish up here with early detection and rapid response. So, I mean, I'm showing you all the work that they're doing on our known infestations, but then um, a big part of what our crew is doing is, you know, they're going to these sites. So this is Rocky Oaks um, and they're, they're visiting where these weed infestations were recorded before the fire. So we have Phalaris aquatica, we have, um, I'm sorry, harding grass, I'll say, and Italian thistle. And then we have a little bit of yellow star thistle that occurred before the fire too. So that was like a, an early detection um, you know, uh, find there and we, we treated it and removed it right away. Um, but after the fire, our technicians found several of carnation spurge plants. And so they pulled them right away and they marked where they were. But um, this is an example of how a species can get started in a new area. So we've never had euphorbia um, carnation spurge occurring at Rocky Oaks, but after the fire, it popped up there. We saw the same thing happen at Paramount Ranch with artichoke thistle. So we don't have artichoke thistle there, or at least it's not recorded in our, in our recordings, but we started seeing a little bit of it popping up after the fire. And um, again, this is how they spread. They have that open substrate. You know, They can get established if we don't take care of them right away. And then now the, the land managers of the future have, um, have a big problem on their hands. And then the last site was, oh, this was terrifying. They found some yellow star thistle at Zuma Canyon. And we don't have a ton of yellow star thistle in our mountains. We did have a lot of it at Paramount Ranch, that sequence that I showed you. But now um, to see it pop up in the Malibu area at a site where it's never been. And again, it was about five or six plants and they hand pulled them and um, marked it down. And so that's the benefit of having those trained um, technicians out there surveying for you. And then this is true uh, early detection and rapid response stuff. Uh, this is skeleton weed. And we don't have this anywhere in the mountains except for Palo Camado. And the group you're looking at here is um, John Beale's group 
with uh, U.S. Um, Food and Agriculture, Department of Agriculture. He's, um, they were out there surveying this area and they had let us know about um, the skeleton weed. And so our crew has been up there treating for the last couple of years and the population, the infestation is pretty small. And um, I think we can get it eradicated, you know, um, as long as we stay on top of it. So kudos to John for letting us know about that. It's great to have partners that are, that are watching uh, these areas as well. And then um, we are exploring more of this idea um, of using community science for, um, for help from the public. So this is one of our projects that we have on iNaturalist. It's called the Evil 25, and it deals with the 25 uh, most ecologically damaging species. And the main purpose of this is early detection and rapid response um, in new areas. So like, right, if, we, if we're starting, if someone starts seeing, reporting yellow star thistle in an area where we don't normally see it in the mountains, we can, we can go address it right away. Um, there are not two members, there are now nine members. Just wanna make that clear. You could be number 10, if, especially if you're down in the Santa Monica area. Um, we would love to have um, some careful eyes helping us find this stuff. But if your data are open, as most people's are, then, um, then we'll just end up getting your data. Uh, there's over 2000 observations so far for this um, project. And these um, community science groups are just great. You know, there, there's uh, other species that have been addressed like uh, stink net over in Point Magoo, which is not in the burn area, um, but that was the first time it appeared in our mountains. Um, and then there is also woolly distaff thistle that's also been reported on iNaturalist. And that's something that we're taking care of. It's also outside of the burn area, but um, we've just been recently went up there to, to deal with that species. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the big things that we have, projects that we have happening um, across the Santa Monica Mountains and that we're partnering with um, this group that's going to be doing aerial monitoring of our ecological or of our 25, our evil 25. Um, we're, we're partnering with Wildlands Conservation Science who will be um, conducting the surveys and they're, they'll be looking at the, um, the most damaging invasive species, our target species, but a really big part of what they'll be doing is early detection and rapid response. And they'll be compiling a group or, or a list of um, species from CalFlora and for, from the California Invasive Plant Council as well, um, alert species is what we call them, um, species that we should be on the lookout for, but that we maybe don't necessarily know are, are in our mountains. This is wonderful. Like the work that they can do in a few weeks, it would take us a couple of years to do um, on foot. So they can tell us right away what the mountains look like. And it's, it's especially important following the fire. Are there, you know, are there new weeds that we're not aware of in these hard to get places. And if that's the case, we can go up there right away and we can take care of it. And um, that's gonna save us a lot of heartache in the, in the long run. Okay, so what's next for us? Well, we're doing a, a lot of restoration over the next couple of years. We're planning on putting in 100,000 plants, native plants over the next two years. Uh, if you're in the area, come volunteer with us. Uh, we would love to have you join us. Uh, we will be picking up weed warrior events as well. So we'll be doing a lot of invasive plant control. Um, a lot of times the invasive plant control happens around the restoration sites. And um, we can use any help that we can get. Uh, there's, there's two of us, uh, there's myself and then our uh, plant ecologists that are permanent staff. And then we have our botanist as a term as well. So all the work that we, we do is really it's us reaching out to others for help in and having the public help restore their public lands. So with that, I thank you and I'll pass it on to Andrea. Thanks, Joey, it's great. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about our fire followers project and community science in some of the 2020 fire areas. 
So I work for the California Native Plant Society. We've been protecting California's native flora since 1965 through a combination of conservation, education, gardening, rare plant science, and vegetation science. So that is a lot of science. Um, but the amount of data that, that we on staff or even our 10,000 members can collect is, is fairly limited. You know, California is a, is a huge state with a lot of things going on. Um, and there's funding, there's staffing constraints, there are geographic and political boundaries that can keep us from collecting data. And it can be difficult to set up and manage long-term studies. And we do um, a fair bit of that, particularly our vegetation program with their mapping and monitoring throughout the state and our rare plant program with a lot of the, the rare plant treasure hunts that we do, which is also a community science program. But we can overcome some of these obstacles by integrating observations from the general public. And people are very much able to map species locations. They can find historic records and try and refine those plants. Um, People can monitor numbers and species composition. And if you set up your questions correctly in a way that can be answered by community scientists, um, you can get a lot of really quality data. So after the 2020 California wildfires, um, I wrote a grant to the Seabird Foundation, um, which awarded us funding to start this fire followers program. And what it is is a, a rapid response volunteer driven community science monitoring project. And what we're trying to do is collect biodiversity data from areas impacted by this historic fire season. And what we really wanna do is we understand that, you know, fire is often a devastating thing for people, particularly those who've lost their homes. But fire in California is something that's been going on for centuries. Um, and very often, you know, it, it's people who were starting these fires, and even today, it's largely people who are starting the fires. But it's not always a terrible thing for the plants. Um, there are a lot of plants that need fire to to resprout and grow. And what we want to do is is have people participating in the recovery of the land, and and making their observations, sharing their observations and stories. People who are in these communities and next to these fires so that we can increase the understanding of, of what fire is and what it does in California. So it's, it can be, as I said, quite devastating, um, both to plants and to people, and not just the, the direct burns. So between four and five million acres burned um, in 2020 in about 100 different fire events across the state. And even those who weren't right by the the fires themselves were impacted by wildfire smoke for, for about a month. Um, you know, the skies went orange and it was very apocalyptic and, and pretty concerning. Um, so it's really helpful to, in recovery, you know, to, to actually go out and observe these areas to look at, you know, what are the plants doing? Are they coming back? Um, what's coming back and where? And so fire followers, you know, that's, that's a term that we use for plants that are in some way dependent on fire to either germinate or to, um, to reproduce or to, to be there in, in some large numbers. So when people say these areas are devastated, it's only the above ground vegetation that's really been cleared in a lot of these spots. And fire followers can remain dormant, you know, for over a hundred years in the soil, just lying in wait for the next burn. And sometimes there are smoke cues, sometimes there are heat cues that can cause germination in many species. Or there are some plants like lupins that will occur in small numbers without fire, but really attain massive numbers post burn. Um, a lot of the geophytes or bulbs are, are like that as well. And what fire does is it creates a bare ground and kind of levels the playing field. So a lot of the invasive grasses and shrubs are temporarily cleared. You have open space for seedlings and annuals to grow. As, um, as we heard earlier, there's you know, this pulse of nutrients that, that plants can take advantage of. And fire followers do tend to disappear over time. Succession continues, competition for, competition for space and light increases. So within three to five years after the burn, it's, it's kind of like pre-burn conditions. But those plants have had a chance to sort of replenish the seed bank and just wait for the next opportunity. 
Um, not everywhere responds to fire the same way and not all plants respond to fire the same way. So some of them are tolerant of, of fire, some of them are dependent on it. There are a lot of long-lived species that have adaptations. Um, you see the redwood forest here, a lot of the redwoods have very thick bark. Um, fire can cause, um, can cause them to sprout after they've been burned. We have a lot of really great pictures in our project of redwoods re-sprouting vigorously from all over their trunk and their branches um, post-fire after they've been burned. Fire, as I mentioned, can cause seeds to sprout or stimulate vegetative growth, and some species will disappear, disperse, and recolonize later. Um, fire effects on the landscape are also uneven, so there's a, usually a patchwork or a mosaic that's based on a, a variety of factors. So the fire intensity and severity that um, has to do with the plant continuity, um, the amount of vegetation that's there, and the severity of the fire that comes through. Um, the topography and weather have a lot to do with how intense the fire is as well. And the plant community itself um, can, in some cases, you know, really make the situation that, that they like for fire. So it's Invasive Species Action Week, and we're here to talk about invasive plants. So this is a photo um, by Velia Drome on iNaturalist that's in our project. You can see on the left-hand side, the, I think that's a Hasbro yucca that's blooming. Um, but the, the green pieces are uh, Spanish broom that are re-sprouting from the base after a fire. So yeah, I saw from the poll at the beginning that folks are, are pretty knowledgeable about invasive species. And I just like to, to clarify terminology. So we do have uh, non-native plants that are introduced in some way, brought into California. Um, on purpose or on accident. Um, and then there are invasive plants that are plants that cause damage to California, either through um, outcompeting or um, otherwise taking resources from native species or have some sort of economic um, consequences. So to agriculture or, um, or grazing. And there are fire followers in invasive plants as well. So um, this is the different kind of magic in the seed bank. Um, you can have uh, plants such as the broom species that can lie dormant in the soil for over 100 years, lying in wait for the next burn. Um, smoke or heat can cause germination that, in them too, and some species, um, particularly this, this black mustard, can occur in small numbers without fire, but post-burn, they're able to take advantage really quickly of the, the extra resources that are available um, and really, really go for it. Um, thistles are another type of fire follower that is able to take advantage of this bare ground. Um, they often blow into these burned areas and even if you, you know, without a wildfire, if you just have a burn pile, you'll very often see Italian thistle or milk thistle coming into that area. Um, there's open space for seedlings and annuals to grow and, and some of them will drop out after a while. Um, but some of them will, will use that foothold in the system um, and persist for quite some time. So our fire followers project, um, cnps.org fire followers. There are several ways to get involved. If you're near a burned area, you can go out and um, collect plant data via the iNaturalist app. Um, so you can download it and join the project. You don't need to join the project to have your observations count. They'll be automatically aggregated, but if you join the project, that lets us see um, some additional information if you, if you happen to see a rare species, um, and it'll also qualify you for our, our challenges and compete for prizes. So we do have um, some pins and hats and, um, and shirts and stickers that are really great. Um, this week, we had some prizes donated by Calypsi and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So it's, um, we have those great prizes. You can see those on our iNaturalist project in our project journal. Um, if you're not in or near a burned area, you can help identify plants if you know plants. If you have a particular species that you're a specialist in, you can type that into the, the project bar and um, identify a lot of plants. We also have on this site um, some, some ID, not ID, um, some guides to help you, like how to download INAT, how to make an observation, how to take a good photo. So there's a lot of information 
on this website. And if you can't do either of those things, you can still help spread the word. So um, if you know people in these communities, you can um, let them know about the Fire Followers campaign, or if you're on social media, you can spread the word that way. So for this particular week, our weekly challenge is for, um, I would say three species, but it's actually six or seven, depending on how many broom species you count. Um, so these are species that we're focusing on for this week. They're fairly widespread throughout the state, but not um, ubiquitous. They're gonna be fairly visible this week um, and they're problematic for different reasons. So um, broom species in particular are uh, a type of fire follower. They're actually in the same tribe in the pea family as lupins. And so they have that similar reaction often to fire. It scarifies their seeds. It creates a flush of seedlings from the seed bank. Um, and then they can grow up to form dominant stands. This happens a lot in oak woodlands or cleared chaparral. Um, a lot of these broom species will come in and, and remain dominant. They can retain a lot of dead material, as you can see in this photo, and that can actually help fuel future fires. So chaparral itself, when it does burn, it burns rather intensely, but it's fairly resistant to ignition unless there are usually invasive species that are in and amongst it that, that provide fuel for that fire. Yellow star thistle is another one. Um, we heard a lot about that earlier today. It's, it's actually found pretty broadly across the state, um, 15 to 20% of it, and people are, are taking a lot of steps to, to drive that um, acreage down. But um, we're particularly interested in observations that are kind of at the edge of the range or observations that are in an area that they haven't been seen before. Tokolote is, is a little similar to that, but the, the spines are more flexible and purplish, not nearly as long and stabby as the ones that you see here. Um, crimson fountain grass, um, it's maybe been changed to synchrous cetaceous. I'm gonna still say Penicetum cetaceum because I'm not quite, I'm not ready to make the change yet. Um, this plant is found in open sandy or rocky areas, and it often grows in places that don't usually have enough continuous vegetation to carry fire. So areas like Joshua Tree or some of the spots in Santa Monica Mountains, um, or these, they can catch fire more quickly than native vegetation. So you can see on the left-hand side, that plant has a lot of dead thatch in and amongst that bunch. So it's a bunch grass with this feathery spike-like inflorescence. Um, a lot of times it's marketed to folks as being a sterile cultivar, um, the, particularly the red-leaved ones, but you can see, you know, I, I've been walking around, I think at a Calypsi conference when it was in San Diego way back in the day, you know, somebody will have the red cultivar in their yard and then the sidewalk crack right outside their yard is, is the green version. Um, so it's kind of, it's mostly sterile, but mostly sterile when you make hundreds of thousands of seeds and you're 99.99% .99 sterile, you know, you can do the math on that. And the, the offspring that they have are obviously not sterile. So I wanna get into a little more, some of the resources. Um, so our iNaturalist project has um, a lot of information on it and maps of the different fire areas, their names, each of those had individual uh, projects associated with them. So if you really wanna get people excited about the mineral fire and um, get local folks collecting information, you can have, um, have them join that project and do some outreach around that. But they all kind of roll up into our, our, um, our main project. On iNaturalist, you can look up species information, you can look up distribution and phenology, see when people are seeing it and where people are seeing it. You can search by taxonomy or date location, or if you have a project that you're interested in, like you wanna see the, the Evil 25 of SAMO, or you wanna see what's coming up in the fire areas, you can do that. You can make your own project if you're interested in a particular area or species. Um, this will keep a record of your natural history observations. And you can also, as I said, help identify observations made by other naturalists. So when it's baseball season, you can track when I'm on a naturalist by the time when the Giants are playing baseball. So I'll watch the game and I'll identify plants. And that's my version of a jigsaw puzzle. 
So here's the, the banner of our project. We have over 40,000 observations. Um, we went live in March, so that's really great to see. Um, these are the, the most observed species, which is great. They're all native. So Whispering Bells is a, is a huge fire follower. Blue Dicks as well, one of those geophytes that comes up in massive numbers after a burn. And then Chamise doing like really gangbusters resprouting um, after fire and people making a lot of observations of that. And then Diogenes Lantern and Common Star Lily or Death Camus, um, both of those are, are geophytes as well. Um, really common to see those being fire followers. As far as the commonly recorded non-natives, Erodium cicutarium tops the list. Um, Erodiums in general are, are kind of um, opportunistic fire followers. They'll, they're fairly opportunistic and super widespread in California, so it's not really hard to see where they would be kind of tops. Vichia velosa and Lysimachia arvensis are also both, both fairly common. Um, milk thistle and, and Italian thistle are the first two that I would really think of as, as truly fire followers. So you can see these, these fairly widespread species that are kind of interesting to look at are the ones that get observed the most frequently. If you're interested in particular species or you want to um, find some information for a particular area, you can search and download by a variety of different options. So if you want to know a particular taxonomy, let's go to the laser pointer. So if you only want plants or if you only want introduced plants, if you only want observations by a particular person, if you want a date range, an exact date or in a month, you know, if you, if you want to say, okay, I want to see what's been blooming in July, um, you can select that. Um, if you're interested in a particular place, you can do that as well. And then you're also able to download any of these observations. And that's something that, that we're gonna be doing is downloading these observations, bringing them into GIS so we can do kind of some more sophisticated data manipulation. So what are we gonna do with all of this information? We can compare the plants that are seen before and after the fires in particular areas. We can use these photos and these observations to increase our understanding of fire followers, to build a list of fire followers, which there isn't a comprehensive list or database of those, um, to provide information on location of species of concern. So we're seeing a lot of plants that we haven't been seeing before. So we'll get, um, we've gotten a lot of observations of fire evacs, which I didn't even know existed before this. Um, you know, there are, there are mosses and fungi that follow fire. Um, so all of this is, is neat, um, but we're also seeing a lot of rare plants that are coming up or a lot of weeds that are coming up. And so if you're interested in those particular species of concern, we can use these projects and all of these crowdsourced observations to get a better understanding of where those are, when they're blooming, um, and a little bit on how many there are. And we also wanna make more community scientists. So we wanna get people interested in and excited about nature, um, going out there and, and, um, and just learning more and you know, participating with and interacting with nature. So there are obviously some data cautions, particularly when you're dealing with crowdsourced data, there's no real protocol around it. Um, people are just out there and collecting information on whatever they see. And when we compare plants seen before and after fire, um, obviously there, there may not be a similar level of, of survey effort. So we may have a lot more people since we're driving them out there after the fires. Um, there may be additional observations of species after the fire and they may not have been seen before the fire because nobody was looking. There also may be an observation bias to showy species or only to native species or only to non-native species, but a lot of those biases should also be present pre-fire. So um, just having that understanding of, of how your data is being gathered and the, the potential um, biases that, that may be present can help you to, to use that in your analyses. So increasing our understanding of fire followers 
one of the things that we're going to be doing is downloading observations and overlaying them with burn severity maps, as well as the species presence absence data. So we can take a look a little more fine grained, even in a massive 80,000 acre burn area, there are going to be areas that actually didn't burn. So there's a big mosaic on the landscape of how severely an area burned or whether or not it burned. Um, we can use that information to, to look at, are there changes in what species we see in severely burned areas versus moderately burned areas versus unburned or, or very mildly burned areas. So we can also get information, as I mentioned, on species of concern. iNaturalist doesn't prompt for abundance or distribution data. You get data as points only. And so for something like lupins, where you get a huge flush, or um, like California poppies, you get a huge flush of poppies, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that you're going to pick that up, because people are going to be observing poppies before the fire, observing poppies after the fire. And it's going to take a little bit of nuance and, um, and slicing and dicing to really figure out if there are changes in the abundance of these plants. So we do definitely want to make more community scientists. The quantity of data can somewhat uh, compensate for quality. And we are also seeing a lot of folks, researchers who are going in post-fire, who are posting things on iNaturalist. And we super appreciate that. It's a great way to get people excited and learning about um, both the species and the research that's going on. But we also need more people who are experts to help identify. Um, identify the things that people are seeing and more training to make people skeptical of accepting whatever identifications the program suggests. So iNaturalist will suggest um, will suggest a species or a genus or a family based on photo characteristics. And it's not great for plants. It's actually super terrible for grasses, which is a particular interest of mine. So um, so that's just something that people need to to know is to you know, I'm, I'm lazy, but I'm also suspicious. So I will, you know, let the computer suggest an identification for me, but then I'll go, you know, usually over to Calflora and then over to the Jepson eFlora, and I'll take a look at the description and some photos and do some, some comparisons. And speaking of Calflora, it's a great website to look up native and introduced plant species for all of California. You can search by county, you can search by taxonomy or life form or bloom month. So a lot of the same things that you can do in iNaturalist. Um, you have plant profiles that will show distribution and photos and links to other references. The one thing that you can do in Calflora that you can't do in iNaturalist is record, record polygon observations. So if you really want to do some weed mapping, I would suggest using Calflora as your main mode of, of observation. Here's an example of one of the taxon pages. Um, so you can see it gives you additional um, locations of that plant and links to other information. If you are interested in a particular area, you can look at the what grows here function. Um, again, those different ways that you can pick options of what you want to see in a particular spot. So once again, the how to get involved in our fire followers project. It's been really gratifying to see just the observations that are coming in and the excitement that people are seeing about the project. And I really wanna, I wanna see this continue. Um, we're seeing folks from other part of the country who are picking this up and running with it, which to me is the, the greatest flattery. Um, CNPS also has a fire recovery guide um, so you can go onto our website and submit your information, get a copy of PDF over email. It's got information on fire ecology, information on defensible space, um, information on restoration, whether or not you should seed, what you should do, um, all of those things. So one of the things that I did want to stress, this is also on our site, um, is to know before you go. So a lot of these burned areas are closed. Um, please do respect closures. We have information um, on, you know, hazards that are out there. As Joey mentioned, the, the tree cover is a particular um, hazard and then footing 
you know, so there are a lot of times where plants will burn, their root systems will actually burn underground. And so there's a, there's a hole where a root used to be. And so you can, you know, step on that and break through the, the crust of the soil and into that hole. So um, staying, that's why a lot of these areas are closed because they can be hazardous. But we do have um, information on our website for areas that are open and tips on safety and accessibility. And it's been really great to see also um, some of our partners. So the folks up um, at the Sonoma Ecology Center are doing a lot of observations in the glass fire and uh, Save Mount Diablo did some bio blissing in some of the burned areas. Um, so you're seeing a lot of really tremendous things. And so here's some, some blue dicks for you um, and my contact information. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think we have, uh, we're a little over here in time, but we would, we have a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so we would like to address those. So we'll be running over and, and uh, for a few minutes to do those live. Did you have, um, Doug, before we bounce into that and we lose a bunch of people, were there any things um, that needed to be shared with folks? Good question. They don't have um, a few minutes to say. Yeah, let's go ahead and share again the link to the um, feedback form. Um, if you could do that, Claire. And a uh, reminder to folks, <laughs> we think we have it set up so that you get that automatically after this presentation, but we're not quite sure. So we're gonna put the link here and we may send it out in an email afterwards as well. Feedback will help the University of California assess um, how well we're doing with the webinars and what uh, topics might be useful to cover in the future. So thank you for for following up with that. But yes, we're, we're over time, but we're going to stay as long as there's, well, <laughs> up to a limit, People. as long as there's <laughs> interested conversation. But feel free to drop off if you need to get back to work. Um, this recording will be posted on the same Invasive Lunch uh, page on the UCANR website. So you can always come back and look later. So yeah, let's hear some and questions. Of course, all right. That, of course, assumes that our uh, speakers are able to stay as well. So uh, first question, Andrea, for you from uh, Barbara Breildorf, uh, whether uh, what, what folks can do about uh, gathering data from fires that are uh, older, that occurred earlier, um, to give a longer term perspective on fire response. Yeah, there are a couple of ways that you can do that if you have access to iNaturalist and um, can either draw in or upload the fire boundary um, and create a place in iNaturalist. Um, there are a lot of folks who are doing that. And I think, you know, the, the Thomas and Woolsey fires um, have uh, places in iNaturalist. And so you can just use that as a, as a, a space to gather observations. You know, people have been recording information, um, whether or not there's been a fire there. So you can use that, um, use that sort of lasso to, to get the points and plants that people have observed in those fire areas. Great. And so it just won't be part of this particular project that you um, have described. Excellent. So for Joey, um, Rosa Schneider is asking, um, do you prior, how do you prioritize burned areas to survey and how long does bar funding last? Yeah, so uh, the way that we prioritize this. If, if you could speak a little louder, I think it's sure. soft. Yeah. yeah, so the way that we prioritize this project was um, we looked at the our weed database and that decade of treatments that we have been doing over, um, you know, for a long period of time before the fire. So uh, the idea was that we, you know, this fire burned close to 90% of National Park Service land. And we just thought, well, probably the best way to tackle this is to go to those locations where we know the weeds are, or where they have been before the fire. Um, the assumption being that that's probably where um, they're gonna be worse for us. The, 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 you know, they're gonna be the most problems. Um, a lot of those areas are disturbed, for example. Um, and then we did also, I didn't mention this, but we did also look at sensitive uh, species locations and sensitive habitat locations. So we did surveys of those areas as well for um, our target invasive species, but then also um, really any invasive species. So ubiquitous mustards and annual grasses as well. And we collected data on that. And then that's, that will guide us um, moving forward. Um, on what we should be doing to try to protect those areas. 
Uh, as far as bar funding goes, uh, it's generally um, up to three years and you can apply for, for more, I believe. Um, this will be the final year of funding for us though. So we had two years of bar funding and one year of bear funding. So a total of three years of funding. Uh, one more here for you briefly. Uh, Joey, did you have any stink wart or Sahara mustard? You had stink net, you said, but what about stink wart? Not that I know of, and not that I know of with Sahara mustard either. Good, no. no, not not with either of those. No, okay. uh, we have we have the mustards that we have are um, Mediterranean mustard and black mustard, and those are just widespread, um, very widespread species across California. Right. Here's a general one that you guys can both team together on. Uh, how do invas new invasive species make their way into burned areas? Count the ways. I mean, I can, I can tackle that. Um, so there are a lot of different ways. Some of them can, it depends a lot on how they disperse. So as I mentioned, a lot of the thistles will, will blow into burned areas. They have the feathery pappus on their seeds. Um, but a lot of times it's people. So um, when I was back, when I worked with the Park Service and, and Joey, you probably know about this, the working together against weeds, there's a lot of uh, prevention work that you can do. If firefighters are coming in from all over, obviously there's an emergency, um, uh, they can track in, we as biologists and, and observers can track invasive species into these areas. Um, they can come in on equipment, they can come in on animals. Um, there's a lot of different ways. So invasive species are, are really good at getting around. Um, and so sometimes it's dispersal, but sometimes it's um, attached to us. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yes. And I add to that a lot of times it's just the fact that the environment is ideal for invasive species. So um, if you have intact native vegetation, they, it does a pretty good job of keeping invasive species out. So the propagules themselves, like the seed, may be there, and it may have been there before the fire, but it's, it's, the, um, it's the opening up of that substrate and creating these ideal conditions for um, a very competitive, these very competitive species to get a foothold. So it could also be that they just happen to be there and they're just waiting you know, for the right conditions and the fire, the fire is that condition. Yeah, that's a great reminder of the um, how beneficial competitive planting can be and intact habitat. All right, here's an interesting one um, about the pathogenic fungus that has been introduced uh, to bromus that is uh, seems to be uh, somewhat effective in the Midwest. Uh, black fingers of death is what it's called. Has it ever been considered for use in the areas that uh, we are seeing today for passive control measures? Are you? Yeah, it sounds very thoughts? cool. Yeah, uh, what yeah. a cool name. Yeah, I uh, no, we, not to my knowledge, we're not using, we, we certainly are not using that. And I don't know of any land managers in the Santa Monica Mountains who are using that, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess the biological control are, are right, but um, but no, I'm not sure, Andrea. Yeah, biological controls. You know, they they have to go through a lot of testing. Um, we do have some native annual bromes, and so that would be kind of the the overall concern. So there's been a lot of testing. You know, we talked about broom, um, a lot of testing on that, and and cape ivy, and um, I just know that that for broom in particular, because they are in the same tribe as. As the lupins, we had to do some testing on lupins, and that's still um, ongoing. So it's kind of the same deal, you know, how specific is the fungus? If it attacks all bromes, then we have a lot of really important native bromes that would also suffer. So if you think about um, thistles back in the early 1900s, I think, or maybe in the 1930s or 50s, um, there was a, a seed weevil that was introduced to control thistles. And it's been attacking native thistles as well, and, and obviously hasn't really made a dent in the non-native thistles. So being really careful about, about what we do and the effects that it can have on native species as well. That's a good point. So um, things, uh, biocontrol agents need to be permitted and there's always a risk of non-target effects. So 
often not as easy as it seemed. Um, in terms of the mapping of invasives, Andrea, um, do you ever use EDMAPs? I have not. You know, I, I grew up using Calflora for my mapping and and uh, you know, I, I, if I'm doing mapping, I like to either use GIS or Calflora because I can take polygons. Um, from I don't know a lot about EdMaps, but I, you know, I don't want to say I'm set in my ways, but but I have my system, and it's if it's not broke for me, I'm I'm not jumping to a new one. Got it. Yes. And for those who aren't um, familiar with EdMaps, it's a a system that was developed in Georgia. It's more, it's used, used elsewhere in the country. And uh, I think the California Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife has recently um, developed uh, or customized an app for it for use in California as well. Okay. Um, then uh, Chris Stevenson, Joey, it may be a potential volunteer for you. He's asking, are there any areas within the Santa Monica Mountains that need observations? Might be your contact. Yeah, as far as, um, as far as observations go, anywhere in the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, uh, we would like to know about. I mean, if it's invasive species that, um, that they are interested in collecting data on, um, that's great. And sometimes from time to time, I'll have uh, folks email me and just notify me of something that they found that they're concerned about. Um, and that's really helpful because we can always send our crew out. I can go out myself and I can look and see what's out there. Um, if anyone's interested in uh, volunteering with us, you can always reach out to me or um, you can email samo underscore volunteer at NPS. Dot gov and just say that you'd like to join our Weed Warriors program. And um, I think that Claire, yeah, Claire put it up right now, but there's also uh, Eventbrite. We do a lot of advertising of events through um, Eventbrite and the SAMO Fund uh, does that for us, uh, which is our, our nonprofit agency that supports work in the mountains. Um, so yeah, the, the two events that we had this week were on there and um, you'll start receiving notifications of the work that we're doing and we'd love to have you join us. Excellent. All right, I think we're just about there. Um, yes, I think that's about it. Um, then I will pass it over to Doug again. Sure thing. Thank you both of you guys, yeah, this is great. Yeah, thank you very much um, to our speakers today, and Andrea and Joey. Um, super interesting and super relevant as we get ready for more fires um, and uh, try to understand better what the vegetation is doing um, and uh, use that to our advantage. Thank you also to all our attendees today. Um, we have several more talks the rest of the week. Um, hope you will join us and hope you will join the fire followers and other ways to participate as a community scientist. So have a great rest of your Tuesday and uh, we'll hope to see you tomorrow. Bye. Take thanks. Care.